our first presentation is going to be by the newest member of our vascular surgery group. Uh, Robert Knoll just joined us uh, uh, this year. Uh, he's uh, attached to the, uh, the Northern California VA system and uh, also with the David Grant Medical Center, who we are, uh, we are closely affiliated with, uh, with our vascular program. And he's going to uh, talk about uh, current management of aortic aneurysms. Rob, thanks. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, first, administratively, I have no specific uh, disclosures relevant to the discussion today. Although it has been nearly 60 years from the earliest open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair and almost 20 years from the earliest of EVARs, the vascular surgical and interventional management of AAAs remains dynamic and is continuing to evolve. As a result, there remain areas of dispute and as one controversy or question has been settled, another frequently presents itself or in some instances has represented it itself with the advent of endovascular techniques. Uh, today we'll focus upon several specific areas where there is debate regarding best practices in vascular treatment of AAAs. First, in the management of ruptured AAA, has endovascular repair proven itself superior to open repair? Next, following EVAR, what type of surveillance should be done and specifically, do we need all the CT scans that we currently are performing, and how does ultrasound compare? Thirdly, for EVAR, has percutaneous technique or approach to the femoral vessels proven itself to be superior to femoral artery cutdown? And lastly, what is the correct management of small aneurysms at this time, and when, if at all, should they be repaired? It is well known that the mortality of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm is high. The 30-day survival rate of those undergoing open repair is around 50%, a number that, that has been very slow to change over time. With elective EVAR, randomized control trials showed superior outcomes, so it is not surprising that application of endovascular technique to rupture was soon to follow. With the first successful endovascular repair of a ruptured AAA by Marin and Veith in 1994, the percentage of aneurysms that have been repaired in that uh, means has increased steadily, with 17% repaired that way in 2005. This is certainly a number that has increased over the last few years. Many single center reports, retrospective analysis, and population-based studies have shown a substantially lower 30-day mortality with ruptured endovascular repair as opposed to open repair. A listing of our first four studies here shows some of the more recent large series that have compared open and endovascular repairs. And as you can see, there has been a significant reduction in perioperative mortality for the ruptured endovascular repair. The last study compares patients that are both EVAR suitable but have been repaired either in open or endovascular manner, and once again we see a significant reduction in mortality. Further efforts to lower periprocedural mortality have been undertaken with advent of protocols and algorithms. Here we see two, on the right side from the Albany group and on the left side from the group from Harborview. Prior to protocol initiation at the University of Washington, the mortality from rupture uh, was around 58 percent. After institution of the protocol, the mortality decreased to 35 percent. Interestingly, there was no change in the mortality for the open repair cohort. All of the reduction was seen in the endovascular group, and at 30 days, the uh, mortality you see is 18.5 percent here. And while endovascular repair appears to have superior outcomes, with the retrospective studies, there is certainly selection bias in this cohort of patients. Oftentimes, these patients that undergo ruptured EVAR have a more favorable hemodynamic status as they have to undergo CT scanning prior to intervention. They certainly can have a more favorable anatomy as they have to meet basic criteria for endovascular treatment. And oftentimes, the line between urgent and ruptured aneurysms is certainly blurred. Even in those centers that are repairing aneurysms successfully in a ruptured manner, there is still a significant proportion of these that are done open. 
In fact, this usually numbers around 60% of patients that are actually EVAR suitable. So certainly uh, 40, even 50% still require open repair. And lastly, how generalizable are these results? In centers with the appropriate experience, protocols, and infrastructure, they can treat these effectively and with good results, but how about in places where they don't have quite the same experience or infrastructure? There have been prospective randomized trials that have begun in efforts to try and answer the question of which approach is superior. The only randomized study thus far is a pilot study, which was a small group of patients, and it showed essentially no difference. Open and rupture EVAR outcomes were essentially unchanged. The three ongoing trials are the Amsterdam Acute Aneurysm Study. This requires randomization following CT scanning and assessment of EVAR suitability. The French ECAR trial is looking to randomize a goal of 160 patients to one mode of treatment or the other. And lastly, the UK IMPROVE trial, which has a goal of randomization of 600 patients. Certainly a lot of valuable information will, will come out of these trials in the upcoming years. Until these results are out, retrospective sh series have certainly shown uh, a significant improvement in outcomes with the endovascular techniques. EVAR using commercially available devices has been associated with a low rate of aneurysm-related death and reported freedom of rupture 96% uh, or better. Nonetheless, rupture certainly remains a risk. There is general agreement about requirements for surveillance following EVAR, but there is controversy surrounding what type of surveillance and how frequently. The protocols for EVAR surveillance were initially derived from multi-center trials, and they were dictated in the instructions for use. The IFU-derived surveillance regimen typically consisted of follow-up CT scans and four view KUBs at one month, six months, and then yearly thereafter. As the long-term results were initially unknown, the optimal surveillance was unknown as well and not data-driven. Unfortunately, CT, CT scans are certainly associated with their own sets of problems. There are concerns regarding carcinogenic effects, effects on renal function, as well as overall cost. With over 62 million CT scans done yearly in the United States, there is suggestion and concern that up to 2% of malignancies in the future will be attributed to this. What about the effects of CT surveillance on renal function? This study compared the effects of renal function based on supra versus infrarenal fixation in endovascular repair. And while there was no difference seen between new, those two modalities, over the long term, there was a significant decrease in creatinine clearance in both groups. This is more than one would expect based on age alone. Likely, this is affected both by the initial procedure as well as the recurring need for contrasted CT scans thereafter. Also, the cost associated with EVAR surveillance is certainly not minimal. At five years post-surveillance, the cost is around uh, $11,000. One third of this is due to radiologic studies, with the CT scan costing about five times more than the ultrasound does. So duplex ultrasound has been used as an alternative or an adjunct to CT surveillance. There is certainly evidence to support its use in modified surveillance regimens. And using data from the Zenith multicenter trial, Investigators found that in the cohort of patients without early endo leak, they had a significantly reduced incidence of having aneurysm-related morbidity at that point. This, for example, is a population that can be safely followed by a modified surveillance, and this, in this case, involved less frequent CT scans as well as subsequent substitu substitution of ultrasound for CT scan for yearly follow-up. There are prior studies that have shown ultrasound insensitive for endoleak detection. Yet more recently, there is strong supporting evidence that in certain cohorts of patients, they can be followed safely by ultrasound. Yet nonetheless, concerns remain. This can be considered a very operator-dependent technique. 
There is a questionable role in patients that have poor anatomy. And in an increasingly obese population, uh, the there are certainly limitations as far as which patients can undergo this. The current SVS guidelines recommend contrast enhanced CT scanning at one month and 12 months. Duplex ultrasound certainly remains an option in those patients without endoleak or evidence of AAA enlargement in the first year. It remains likely that patterns of surveillance will continue to change, particularly as it becomes more well-defined which patients are at low risk to have long-term complications. Our next controversy is regarding percutaneous versus open femoral artery exposure for EVAR. The development of techniques for large bore sheath closure has enabled a totally percutaneous approach to EVAR as is well known. There has been ensuing debate regarding the merits of these, open, of these endovascular or percutaneous versus open exposures. And if this should be a technique that's employed by most surgeons and interventionalists. Complications associated with open femoral artery exposure include, uh, first of all, uh, long term. Uh, many of these patients have seroma formation uh, in the open group. Uh, in the short term, the complications are essentially, in most studies, are unchanged or equivalent between the two groups. Percutaneous group has shown a decrease in mean surgery time as well as a decrease in time to ambulation. In this series from Northwestern, there were six access-related complications in the open exposure group, three requiring early surgical intervention. In the percutaneous group, nine operative access-related complications occurred. Interestingly, of those that required additional intervention, all seven were done at the same time of the surgery or could be detected right then and there. Later follow-up, however, demonstrated a 23% incidence of complications in the open repair group versus none in the percutaneous group at 30-day follow-up. Large series have shown similar overall technical success rates, in this case using the pre-closed technique with success rates of 94% whether done percutaneously or in the open manner, and essentially a same uh, uh, rate of complications. So while it is clear that percutaneous EVAR can be completed with good technical success, there are several concerns regarding this technique. First, many of the studies which support its use are retrospective in design, and as a result, those undergoing open repair oftentimes are those considered unsuitable for a percutaneous approach. This includes patients with redo groins, uh, those who have uh, particularly calcified iliofemoral arteries, and those who are obese. Also, financial issues include an increased hospital cost for paying for the device and lost reimbursement for the physician who no longer gets paid for the uh, open femoral artery exposure. So there is certainly technical ability to complete this, yet there are certainly subsets of patients likewise that remain poor candidates. And to truly validate the merits of this technique, uh, a prospective controlled randomized trial would be helpful in the future. So with, su with such a high mortality from rupture aneurysm and clear benefits from repair, there has always been a question about what size AAA to fix and concern that we should be fixing these sooner, particularly now with endovascular techniques. This was all first evaluated in the era of open surgery with two randomized controlled trials comparing open repair with surveillance for small aneurysms, the UK small aneurysm trial and the aneurysm detection and management study. In the UK small aneurysm trial, early surgery with surveillance for those aneurysms four to five and a half centimeters were compared. The key findings were that there was essentially no difference seen in long-term outcomes or mortality. But notably, over 60% of those patients uh, in their surveillance group underwent surgery later. The aneurysm detection and management trial looked at over 1,100 VA patients with AAAs four to 5.4 centimeters in size. And again, they were randomized to surveillance versus early repair. And as in the UK small aneurysm trial, again, there was no significant survival difference with the mean follow-up of 4.9 years. And once again, more than 60% of those in the surveillance group subsequently underwent uh, open repair. And while there was no benefit seen in either one of those trials to early repair, 
both compared, of course, open repair to surveillance. Studies of EVAR confirmed a lower periprocedural mortality, and furthermore, evidence suggested that EVAR had better success rates with, with smaller aneurysms. So the question then became, did EVAR change its suitability for smaller aneurysm repair? To sort all this out, we also have two uh, prospective randomized trials. The CESAR trial began in 2004 and sought to randomize those patients with small AAAs to either EVAR or surveillance with delayed repair. The primary outcome, again, was all-cause mortality. And again, there were no significant difference in aneurysm-related mortality, 30-day mortality, aneurysm rupture, or secondary procedure rates. And notably, at three years after randomization, once again, a large proportion, nearly 60% of these patients, underwent treatment. This varied based on the size of the initial aneurysm. In those 5 to 5.4, 90% of those patients underwent uh, repair later on. Interestingly, though, of those requiring repair in that surveillance group, 18% of them lost EVAR suitability and had to undergo open repair. The results of the pivotal trial mirror this. In this study, patients with AAAs between 4 and 5 centimeters were similarly randomized to early EVAR or surveillance. Rupture or aneurysm-related death and overall mortality in the two groups were compared with the mean follow-up of 20 months. Both early treatment with EVAR or surveillance appear to be safe alternatives for patients with smaller aneurysms 4 to 5 centimeters in size. For those with surveillance, in this case, 31% underwent open aneurysm repair. So we have four prospective randomized trials that have shown no survival benefit to early repair. And while it's safe to repair smaller aneurysms using EVAR early, it is certainly equally safe to monitor them. Yet clearly a significant number of these patients go on to have some type of repair, whether endovascular or open. And perhaps the size alone of the aneurysm is not telling the whole story. Knowledge or evaluation of wall stress or other parameters may lend further insight into which patients uh, may be more likely to benefit from early repair. And furthermore, which of these patients are losing EVAR suitability and how may they benefit from early repair as well. The economic and quality of life data will be reported in the future with the pivotal trial, and they may lend additional insight into management of small aneurysms. So in a best effort to summarize in just a few sentences uh, these uh, controversies, ruptured EVAR is demonstrating improved survival, uh, further improved outcomes when protocols are in place. Uh, we have randomized controlled trials in progress currently. Surveillance, which has traditionally been with CT scan after EVAR, uh, in certain select groups of patients, those considered lower risk to have problems down the road, uh, these can be followed adequately with uh, a complex, uh, excuse me, a contrast enhanced duplex, uh, excuse me, duplex ultrasound uh, and uh, uh, CT scan perhaps early on at one month, maybe at a year as well, supplemented by 4-view KUB. Uh, percutaneous EVAR has good technical success. Uh, there are definitely patient groups that should not undergo this. Uh, currently, as sheath size, sizes decrease, uh, there will be uh, uh, probably more applicability of that. And lastly, small aneurysm repair, uh, while safe right now, uh, is certainly equally safe to uh, undergo surveillance uh, and should only probably be used in certain select patients. Thank you. And good morning. Uh, first, administratively, I have no specific uh, disclosures relevant to the discussion today. Although it has been nearly 60 years from the earliest open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair and almost 20 years from the earliest of EVARs, the vascular surgical and interventional management of AAAs remains dynamic and is continuing to evolve. As a result, there remain areas of dispute and as one controversy or question has been settled, another frequently presents itself, 
or in some instances has represented it him, itself with the advent of endovascular techniques. Uh, today we'll focus upon several specific areas where there is debate regarding best practices in vascular treatment of AAAs. First, in the management of ruptured AAA, has endovascular repair proven itself superior to open repair? Next, following EVAR, what type of surveillance should be done? And specifically, do we need all the CT scans that we currently are performing, and how does ultrasound compare? Thirdly, for EVAR, has percutaneous technique or approach to the femoral vessels proven itself to be superior to femoral artery cutdown? And lastly, what is the correct management of small aneurysms at this time? Our first presentation is going to be by the newest member of our vascular surgery group. Uh, Robert Knoll just joined us uh, uh, this year. Uh, he's uh, attached to the, uh, the Northern California VA system and uh, also with the David Grant Medical Center, who we are, uh, we are closely affiliated with, uh, with our vascular program. And he's going to uh, talk about uh, current management of aortic aneurysms. Rob, thanks. Uh, thank you. Way in 2005. This is certainly a number that has increased over the last few years. Many single center reports, retrospective analysis, and population-based studies have shown a substantially lower 30-day mortality with ruptured endovascular repair as opposed to open repair. A listing of our first four studies here shows some of the more recent large series that have compared open and endovascular repairs. And as you can see, there has been a significant reduction in perioperative mortality for the ruptured endovascular repair. The last study compares patients that are both EVAR suitable but have been repaired time, and when, if at all, should they be repaired. It is well known that the mortality of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm is high. The 30-day survival rate of those undergoing open repair is around 50 percent, a number that, that has been very slow to change over time. With elective EVAR, randomized controlled trials showed superior outcomes, so it is not surprising that application of endovascular technique to rupture was soon to follow. With the first successful endovascular repair of a ruptured AAA by Marin and Veith in 1994, the percentage of aneurysms that have been repaired in that uh, means has increased steadily, with 17% repaired that 